just relax your arm. Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease is a tragic illness, often difficult to diagnose. When we learn that a person has CJD, the first responses are usually fear, confusion, and frustration. A lack of accurate scientific information about CJD has led to confusion even among healthcare workers and funeral directors. In this video, we'll explore the myths and misconceptions that have made people so fearful of Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. We'll look at CJD and show you what really happens to people who have it. Then, we'll talk to the experts and discuss how it can be transmitted and how it can't. In addition, we'll guide you to the CJD Foundation website at www.cjdfoundation.org, where you'll find links to the CDC and other reliable sites which will provide you with specific CJD nursing care information, as well as research documentation as referenced in this video, and detailed information to support all suggested procedures. You'll also find a detailed brochure entitled Nursing Care of the Patient with CJD. Armed with these scientific facts, we hope to clear up some of the misconceptions about the disease. When most folks think of Crutchfield-Jakob disease, they think of mad cow um, and they flip out. No. As you will learn in this video, only cows get mad cow disease, not people. I don't really know that much about CJD, but everything that I have heard about it, it's, it's highly contagious. No, it is not highly contagious. But even among healthcare professionals, that mistaken fear is so strong that patients and families often have trouble getting the care they need. Dr. Ermius Belay is a medical epidemiologist in the Prion Disease Office in the Division of Viral and Rickettsial Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia. He understands how fear can compromise the sensibilities of healthcare professionals. There is a fear factor about CJD because there are a lot of unknowns about this disease how it occurs, what the agent looks like, and how it could potentially be transmitted. And because of this, a lot of unknowns, people potentially may uh, be afraid of the disease or c catching the disease. But after years of careful research conducted by the best and brightest in the world, the data is in and the message is clear. CJD cannot be transmitted or has not been shown to be transmitted through the airborne route. The agent does not jump into the air, get aerosolized, and be transmitted to other, hu other humans or other patients. Transmission of the CJD agent requires inoculation of brain tissues or nervous tissues coming from a patient with CJD. And the agent has not been shown to be airborne. The experts agree, but your understanding of this disease is key to eliminating the fear factor surrounding it. The name? Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease comes from the two German physicians who first described the illness in the 1920s. CJD is one of a group of diseases called spongiform encephalopathies because of the alterations they produce in the brain. Under the microscope, normal brain tissue looks like this. Large cells like this one are called neurons. There are billions of them. They create tiny electrical impulses that carry messages within the brain. These neurons are delicate. Thousands of chemical processes must work perfectly for them to do their job, and any malfunction can harm them. In CJD, the malfunction involves a protein called a prion protein. Normal neurons have prion proteins covering their surfaces. Normal prion proteins have a molecular shape that looks like this, with most of the molecules organized in spiral formations. In CJD, prion proteins become malformed, and the spiral shapes are replaced by broader sheets. When the abnormal prion proteins come in contact with normal ones, they cause the normal ones to also become abnormal, and that's how the process spreads within the brain. The abnormal prion proteins don't function properly, and they accumulate in the brain. You can see them here, stained brown. Those accumulated prion proteins damage the neurons, and they die. At the same time, tiny spaces appear where there was once normal brain tissue. You can see those spaces as rounded white areas in this image. When the change is fully developed, the brain tissue resembles a sponge, and that's where we get the term spongiform encephalopathy that's been applied to CJD and the diseases that are related to it. But the full name is transmissible spongiform encephalopathy, and the ability to be transmitted is what has caused fear of these diseases. Dr. Paul Brown was a senior investigator at the National Institutes of Health. 
and he chaired the World Health Organization panel that developed infection control guidelines for transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. He points out the paradox that has given rise to fear of infection. Although it is a transmissible disease, it is not in the commonly accepted sense of the word uh, an infectious disease. Hmm? And that's an important distinction. Even if it's not considered infectious in the usual sense, people are still concerned about themselves. Am I at risk for uh, catching the disease from uh, my husband or my wife or my father or whatever? And the answer is almost certainly no. I'd go so far as to say it's certainly no. Uh, you are not at risk. There are so many myths around this disease. The CJD Foundation receives many questions from concerned family members who are worried about getting the disease themselves. We get calls of family members asking us, how do I care for my loved one? Should we put them in a nursing home? Is it contagious? Are we at risk? I have a five-month-old daughter. Do I take my five-month-old daughter to see her grandfather? Um, what kinds of things should we be careful of? By phone, by internet, every day, the foundation feels a myriad of questions from concerned caregivers and families. Listen, my wife has been caring for her father and she's pregnant. Is the fetus in any danger? Um, my husband has CJD. Can we still have sex? I was told I have to put her dog to sleep and to burn everything she touched. Is that true? What about her tears? I've wiped away her tears. Can I catch it that way? Those are all variations of the same basic question. Can I contract CJD by some kind of exposure to a person who has it? Casual contact such as hugging the patient, kissing the patient, uh, or being in the same room as a patient, or taking care of the patient, such as uh, you know, washing the patient, for example, or brushing the patient, helping them with the routine uh, personal care. Those types of contacts have not been shown to have transmitted CJD. Contact with bodily fluids have not been shown to have transmitted CJD. The agent that causes CJD is concentrated in the brain and in the nervous tissues. So inoculation of material coming from the brain is required for the disease to be transmitted from person to person. We've looked for uh, 30 to 40 years uh, for uh, clusters of cases in families. Um, a family presumably has the most intimate contacts uh, that occur in daily living, and we haven't found any transmissions within families for 30 years. So um, I, I think that's a fairly persuasive kind of observation. Statistics prove that physicians, healthcare professionals, funeral directors, and embalmers have no greater risk of contracting CJD than the general population. If we look at what we do know about how CJD can be transmitted, we'll understand why people shouldn't be concerned about contracting this disease. Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease reportedly affects around one person per million per year. In the United States, this translates to 280 to 300 new cases per year. The one per million, I believe, is pretty accurate. And this is because it's not only uh, that the one per million statistics or incidents is shown in the United States, but pretty much in many other countries where surveillance has been conducted, the uh, incidence of CJD had remained at about one per million per year. Most of the cases are classical or sporadic CJD occurring for no as yet known reason. Sporadic CJD affects people mainly over the age of 50. Some school teacher, I'm used to talking to groups of people, not to lights, TVs, cameramen. And once clinical symptoms appear, it has a very short course. There are six known subtypes, all with distinct clinical and pathological features, including ataxia, dementia, and spongiform change. The sporadic form accounts for approximately 85% of the cases. About 15% of CJD cases occur in families that carry an abnormal prion gene. In those inherited or familial cases, patients are born with a gene, but the symptoms don't begin until later in life. Dina Simpson's family carries the gene and has lost 12 members of her family to CJD, including her aunt and her mother. I had to tell her that she was dying of the family disease. 
which was a very, very difficult thing for me to do. And I looked at her and I said, you know the outcome? And she said yes. A simple blood test can discover whether a person is carrying the abnormal gene. Since Dina's mother had it, Dina got tested. I did find out and I'm negative. And because I'm negative, my daughter and any of her children and future generations will not be affected by the disease. The third type of CJD is acquired by infection. To transmit the CJD agent, there has to be direct contact with brain or nervous system tissue in order for this to occur. Transmission of CJD has been documented in instances where inoculation of the brain tissue uh, took place from one patient to another. Now this has been documented, for example, through inoculation of human growth hormone. A human growth hormone is obtained from pituitary glands, which essentially is part of the brain. And if the pituitary came from cadavers who have died of CJD, and the human growth hormone extracted uh, from the cadavers has, has been shown to have transmitted CJD. Uh, this occurred before 1985, and in 1985, when this was first identified, the use of human growth hormone obtained from human cadavers was discontinued. But there continues to be the occurrence of CJD related to human growth hormone because of the long incubation of the disease. But all these patients were exposed before 1985. Another way CJD has been shown to be transmitted is through the use of Duramater. The Duramater is a substance that covers the brain and sometimes it will be used in neurosurgical procedures to patch up part of the uh, brain that was operated on. And if the Duramater is obtained from human cadavers who've died of CJD, that Duramater potentially could transmit the disease. And such transmissions have been documented in the United States and elsewhere in the world. Again, the use of Duramater has been discontinued in 1987 when it's been shown that this material has transmitted CJD. Uh, the occurrence of this form of CJD has essentially ceased because of the discon discontinuation of the use of Duramater grafts. The other way CJD has been shown to be transmitted is through the use of neurosurgical instruments. If neurosurgical instruments are used on a CJD patient uh, and are used in another patient without proper sterilization or autoclaving, they could potentially transmit CJD. So all instances where CJD has been shown to be transmitted from person to person involve inoculation of materials that came in contact with the brain or other nervous tissues. There are a couple of hundred cases due to growth hormone, a couple of hundred cases due to dura, and uh, a smattering of cases due to surgical instrument cross-contamination, um, and one or two cases due to a cornea uh, transplant. So that's pretty rare and, and, and disappearing. But there are also acquired prion diseases or variant CJD that are transmitted by the consumption of contaminated material. That's what happened in the United Kingdom in the 1990s. In the variant CJD, it's a different story. In variant CJD, the disease has been shown to be transmitted from cows infected with bovine spongiform encephalopathy or the mad cow disease. And that transmission has been believed to have occurred through ingestion or consumption of cattle products that have been contaminated with the, uh, with the uh, mad cow disease agent. But that's different from the classic form of CJD that occurs in the United States. In the U.S., a different prion disease called chronic wasting disease affects deer and elk. There is great concern about whether it may be transmitted to humans. Dr. Pierre Luigi Gambetti is director of the National Prion Disease Pathology Surveillance Center in Cleveland, Ohio. He and his colleagues have analyzed the brain tissue from virtually every hunter in the United States that has been reported to have CJD. Let's take it an example of a hunter who has consumed on a regular basis uh, elk and deer meat and comes down with a prion disease. Immediately the question is, is that sporadic CJD or is a CJD that has been acquired by eating contaminated elk and deer meat? So we have no evidence of uh, uh, transmission of chronic wasting disease to, you, to humans so far. 
As we've seen, the transmission of CJD is almost exclusively limited to vanishing types of invasive medical procedures, not food, and certainly not patient contact. Armed with this knowledge, patients, families, and professionals alike can care for CJD patients without fear. But the key is education. Education is very important in CJD. Education for physicians, education for uh, health care personnel who are taking care of CJD patients, education for pathologists, and education for embalmers or funeral directors. So education about what CJD is, uh, how it's transmitted, and how it's not transmitted should be, uh, should be uh, provided at every level, uh, starting from the hospital, the physicians, infection control personnel, and also funeral directors. Next, we'll look at the healthcare settings where you work and learn what you, as health professionals, need to know when caring for CJD patients. I drove right past our street. On the way home, you kind of get yourself in a preoccupied mode. I hope this isn't one of these early senior moments. Or this is the face of Kreutzfeldt Jakob disease, normal, vibrant people whose lives and the lives of those they love are changed forever. No treatment, no cure. It's a devastating situation, and as healthcare professionals, you were called on to care for and comfort these patients and their families, as you would anyone in your charge. Learning that there is no personal risk to the caregiver is an important first step. Marie Kasai is a nurse who's an infection control specialist. Her husband, Bob Kasai, is a funeral director. They both encountered Kreutzfeldt Jakob disease in their work, but they became well acquainted with it when Marie's mother died of CJD. Watching my mother die of this disease was probably the most difficult thing I've ever had to do because there was absolutely nothing I could do to help her other than to make her comfortable. As an infection control nurse, Marie knows the facts about CJD, but many of her colleagues don't. She hears questions at work from staff members who aren't always so easy to convince. It's the fear that this disease is contagious from one person to another or from body fluids to another. That is the biggest fear. But we know now simply that isn't the case. Unless a healthcare provider comes in direct contact with infected brain or spinal tissue, there is no cause for alarm. Healthcare workers who are taking care of CJD patients in, by cleaning their beds or taking their bedpans and routinely taking care of the patients should follow standard clinical practices. So the standard infection control precautions our healthcare personnel would take would protect them not only from CJD but from other diseases. Getting medical help shouldn't be a problem, and yet the CJD fear factor is present even in hospitals, where the staff is used to dealing with high risk situations. But with such a rare disease, even highly trained people may not be aware of the facts, and they may have heard the rumors. Huge potential um, for anxiety. Um, mainly because um, we just simply don't see it that often. All the attendants that came in to attend to him, they'd all put on a disposable schmock and a face mask and gloves, and we're all sitting there in our street clothes, you know? So it was, it was kind of uh, silly in my opinion, but uh, what are you gonna do? It's certainly reasonable to want to avoid any exposure that puts you at risk. But as we've shown, interaction with a CJD patient, even intimate contact, isn't dangerous. As infection control specialists, Susan Koch and Marie Kazai both teach the value of standard precautions for all patients, including those with CJD. Universal precautions um, tell um, healthcare folks that they should wear protective equipment if they expect contact with blood, with any body fluids, um, and that's it. So that's, that's everyone, whether they have a communicable disease or not. And to draw blood, the only protective equipment you need is gloves. Ordinary contact with CJD patients does not require extraordinary measures. Going in to, to um, say, um, give them medications, going in to talk to them, going in to do uh, an assessment, um, going in to, um, say, uh, hand them their food or help them with their meal, there's absolutely no need for any gloves, gowns, masks in those particular situations. I'll go so far as to go into the room, put my arms around the patient and say, I'm okay with this. 
Um, and that type of thing goes a long way because um, even when you're telling people that it's all right, um, if they don't see a visual demonstration, the belief sometimes is just not there. Contact with bodily fluids have not been shown to have transmitted CJD. The only way CJD has been shown to be transmitted, again, is when, it's, when there's inoculation of tissue that comes from the brain or other nervous tissues. Uh, the agent that causes CJD is concentrated in the brain and in the nervous tissues. We have, over a period of many decades, inoculated a variety of um, secretions and excretions into primates, chimpanzees and monkeys, which are very sensitive uh, to these diseases when they're experimentally inoculated. Uh, we cannot find any transmissions from tears, from saliva, from sputum, from nasal washings, from urine, from feces, uh, from sweat. Uh, none of them have transmitted. Although infectivity has not been demonstrated in blood, the Red Cross will not accept a blood donation from a person who has CJD, who is a blood relative of a CJD patient, or who is regarded as at risk for CJD due to possible past exposure. The fact that the Red Cross will not accept a blood donation seems to send a message that blood might be infectious, even though at present there's been no transmission from sporadic or familial CJD patients. These measures are in place as a precaution. We asked Dr. Roger Dodd, Vice President for Research and Development at the American Red Cross, if he could reassure us about that, and he did. What we've been doing is that any time that we hear about a patient with CJD who has a history of having given blood, we track down where the blood was given, to which hospital the blood was sent, and we try to identify the recipients who got that blood. And so far, um, we've, uh, we've checked about 380 recipients of blood from some 30 donors who uh, actually developed and died of CJD. And uh, so far, we've not found any evidence that any of these blood recipients uh, has developed CJD or indeed any neurologic disease. Although blood from a patient with CJD apparently does not pose a threat, there are some tissues that can transmit CJD to laboratory animals by inoculation into the brain. Tissues that have high infectivity in lab experiments are those of the central nervous system, brain, spinal cord, and eye while low levels of infectivity have been detected in cerebrospinal fluid, kidney, liver, lung, lymph nodes, spleen, and placenta. But they only transmit the disease by direct inoculation. The golden rule for not catching CJD is to avoid a penetrating injury uh, to yourself uh, from anything that has been inside a patient with CJD. Cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF, is examined for diagnostic purposes in suspected cases of CJD. So those who perform a spinal tap could conceivably be at risk, but only if they inoculate themselves with spinal fluid. There haven't been any such cases, even among those who have the most exposure. Nobody who's ever worked with any of these diseases close up in the laboratory, like myself, for 40 years, has ever, uh, has ever gotten the disease. Now that's not a million people, but it's a lot of man years of high exposure on a weekly basis to high infectivity tissues. Hospital staff also worry about contaminating their equipment during a procedure. For example, an electroencephalogram or EEG is an important diagnostic tool to investigate the possibility of CJD. I got a, a stat call from the doctor that he wanted a patient that we have done um, many a times that came back to the hospital and wanted a steady EEG on the patient. He told me he might have C CJD, wasn't sure. And I said, okay, and I proceeded to hook up the patient. The electrical activity of the brain is recorded through 28 small metal electrodes attached to the scalp. This time, the EEG showed a typical pattern that wasn't present on earlier studies, these periodic sharp waves, about once per second on both sides of the brain. At that point, the staff wondered whether the electrodes applied to the patient's scalp might be contaminated and dangerous. 
the hospital had a standard written policy for decontaminating electrodes used on a CJD patient. And yet, one technician was so fearful that instead of disinfecting them, she threw them away. I red bagged them and put them out for disposal. You were afraid? Yes. Some health care workers don't really want to go in the room there. They have a lot of apprehension about having any contact with the patient when in reality they don't have to have that apprehension. When there is a disease, there's a lot of unknown about the disease and people get scared and they try to do more precautions than probably is needed. Surface electrodes have not transmitted CJD because they're not contaminated. When the diagnosis is known, special precautions should be followed to be absolutely certain, but there's no need to discard the electrodes. You know, it's natural to be afraid of something that you don't know about, but now knowing what I do know about it, it's really something not to be afraid of. The discarded electrodes only cost about $200, but fear of CJD has led to some much more expensive wasting of devices. I know of personally hospitals that have thrown out $8,000 GI endoscopes. I know of hospitals that have thrown out a whole set of instruments. I, I know of hospitals, um, and because of the, my peers and I discuss this periodically, that will not do a biopsy on somebody. They just won't do it. Instruments used on a suspected CJD patient during a surgical procedure should be decontaminated using specific decontamination protocols recommended for CJD. Those procedures have been outlined on the CDC website. When a CJD diagnosis is suspected, whenever possible, single-use equipment should be used in surgical procedures and then disposed of. Guidelines also include detailed methods for disinfection of surfaces and disposal of waste materials, preferably by incineration. And while we take precautions to prevent transmitting the disease, we should also be mindful of the need to prevent transmitting fear of the disease. Well, my cousin and I went to 12 different nursing homes in the area, and every single nursing home turned us down. They said, this is contagious, this is dangerous, our staff could be infected, um, we don't want to have her here, we're really sorry that you're going through this. And basically they said, good luck, but we don't want your business. CJD Foundation. The CJD Foundation provides a resource to help families obtain the care they need. We work with nursing homes, with hospices, with funeral homes. Anytime there's a problem and they've called us, we either can answer it, we get or we get the answer, or we refer them to some place where they can get the answer and we follow up. We always follow up. Florence called the one nursing home that was willing to even find out a little bit more information about CJD. And she talked to them, she educated them, she sent them information. Their staff called her on a regular basis and they decided to accept my sister into the nursing home. And gratefully, we were able to really concentrate on what was important, and that was my sister and her last days in this world and making them the best we could. The bottom line for healthcare workers is, not, is that they should not panic while taking care of CJD patients. CJD is not transmitted through the air. It's not aerosolized. It's very, very difficult to catch. It's not transmitted through casual contact, such as taking care of, routinely taking care of a CJD patient, hugging the patient, uh, handling body fluids from a patient, or being in the same room as the patient. So there is no reason to panic while taking care of CJD patients. And the standard precautions that are already in place while taking care of many other patients in a hospital are more than adequate while taking care of CJD patients. Therefore, nursing homes have no reason to refuse CJD patients. Florence Nightingale once said, How very little can be done under the spirit of fear, apprehension, uncertainty, waiting, expectation, fear of surprise. Do a patient more harm. You're doing well today. It's our hope that we've taken some of the apprehension and fear out of CJD so that you as a healthcare professional can freely share your unique gift of caring with these patients and their loved ones.